to Governance Now. This is Gitanjali Minhas and you're watching Checks and Balances. Today, artificial intelligence is an integral part of our lives. We use it at our workplace, we use it within our homes, we use it for social media, for our shopping experience. In the government sector, artificial intelligence is used in telecommunications, banking and finance, agriculture, healthcare, education, defense and so many other things. Now what is artificial intelligence? In simple words, artificial intelligence is the ability of a machine to think and act like a human being without any intervention. It was really the launch of generative artificial intelligence model ChatGPT in November 2022 that really set the internet on fire. Its addictive nature has ushered in a new paradigm not only in the manner artificial intelligence technology is evolving but also how humans are getting completely addicted to this technology for their work. While the technology is still evolving and increasingly being adopted, concerns are being raised on the impact of artificial intelligence on jobs, specifically for India with high unemployment rate, not only in the unorganized sector, but also in the organized sector. How will we prepare our workforce with artificial intelligence skills? International Monetary Fund has warned of substantial disruptions in the labor market and called on the policy makers to come out with quick rules to govern the generative artificial intelligence technology. In March this year, Goldman Sachs had come out with a report stating that artificial intelligence could replace 300 million full-time jobs worldwide. such key points, we delved into the subject with economists, academicians and legal minds. Swaminathan Ramanathan, teacher and researcher at Uppsala University, Sweden, said Artificial intelligence will replace jobs where there is a high degree of repetition that is involved and which today is being done by a human layer. Right, so jobs will get replaced. But artificial intelligence will also go ahead and work in jobs where there is a capacity augmentation required. From my perspective, it is both a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge for India is to go ahead and see how does the overall revolution in artificial intelligence gets leveraged for its own good. So for instance, there are already use cases where ChatGPT, for instance, has been deployed on scale or at scale to farmers at the ground level, where a farmer is actually able to talk to a ChatGPT and get the relevant kind of an information relate to him in his or own language in the accent and in the pronunciation that they want. So artificial intelligence is going ahead and doing the job of a district officer, of a bureaucrat, of an expert, of an agricultural scientist, right? So that's the opportunity that we are talking about. So artificial intelligence is also a way to go ahead and democratize decision-making processes at the ground level. If you're going to go ahead and give artificial intelligence that capability, it also means that there are a lot of agricultural scientists whose roles need to be redefined. There are a lot of people at the district level, at the ground level, at the panchayat office whose roles have to be redefined. That's the challenge. Speaking on chat GPT, Pavan Duggal, Supreme Court advocate, told us. So the biggest problem that today chat GPT faces is the entire issue of hallucination. OpenAI has apparently stated in its terms and conditions that this is technology in progress and therefore it's bound to hallucinate it's bound to give you wrong answers therefore please don't rely upon it but because people are getting addicted to this technology they are often not using their 
shall I say, checks and balances. Yet mm-hmm. another important issue of uh, chat GPT is that the output that's coming up, you don't exactly know whether it's actually going ahead and infringing the intellectual mm-hmm. property rights of other mm-hmm. people because it's been trained on big data sets up to the end of 2021. And mm-hmm. these data sets would also include copyrighted information. So if you are going to put your your uh, name on top of an output from ChatGPT, ChatGPT oh. says, I'm okay with that, but just give me an acknowledgement. But more than mm-hmm. that, if it's found to be in violation of intellectual property rights, uh, mm-hmm. you could potentially be facing yourself uh, some legal trouble and issue. Also right. now, ChatGPT is extensively being misused by prompt command engineering to force it to go ahead and give answers which are in violation of the law. Now ChatGPT is being used by all cyber criminals to come up with new innovative mechanisms for committing cyber crimes, for coming up with new mechanisms to trouble people, to generate more monies and to get more monies out of potential victims. Economist and former vice chairman of Niti Aayog, Rajiv Kumar, told us. For economies like India, which are still in a very early stage of their economic development, they have to become middle income economies and the high income economies, and they have a large population to educate and scale up, etc. You know, and so on. AI uh, can be absorbed because our requirements are very large, especially our requirements for meeting the challenges that this country has facing itself. For advanced economies, which have reached a level of kind of saturation, if you like, of consumption levels, etc., uh, AI poses a real threat. But for us, we are still on the ladder towards meeting the welfare requirements of our people, AI and could will be absorbed and will be absorbed to improve our productivity, to improve our efficiency and most importantly uh, to improve, address the challenge of growing while remaining greener. Now that's our biggest challenge today. I think it is more an enabling force rather than a disabling force, so to speak, right? Okay. So it will enable the human potential to reach and it will be a system which the human beings will have to start learning how to work with. So think about an artificial intelligence as a co-worker. Think about a restaurant or a hotel or caregivers, you know, etc. They are not easy to be replaced by AI or robots and so on. So that's the other part. So it depends really a lot on the sector. Doctors, Diagnostics could be helped by AI, but still the doctor may not be you know, replaced by the AI or the AI-driven robotic because a human patient-doctor relationship is more about more than just about diagnostics and prescribing a drug. It's about an interrelationship as well. The AI is all pervasive, and the impact of AI will be as significant as, for example, the discovery of electricity. In, in, our, in our history. Absolutely that AI will replace jobs, maybe in manufacturing, you know, where combined with 3D printing, it will completely, completely transform the way we manufacture our product, etc. We need to be very conscious of this. We need to be careful with this. We can't be complacent at all about AI. But at the same time, we have to design our policies towards AI. Those jobs, those which will go, will go. Mm-hmm. And not, but there are large number of other sectors where AI could be used you know, to improve, as I said earlier, productivity and the inefficiency and even the employment levels in the country. In this stage of transition and transformation, new jobs like prompt command engineering, where you force artificial intelligence to answer your queries, will create new demand. In fact, the cybersecurity of artificial intelligence itself will create new jobs. Now, how do you scale and rescale your workforce to adapt to the new work ecosystem? On this, our thought leaders told us. The, the period where you got into one career and stayed with it forever, 
I think it's over, it's behind us. Already in the US, every person kind of, I think, if I'm not mistaken, changes careers about 3.6 times in his life, in her lifetime. Now this is going to improve, increase much more. So what you require is the ability for the person to keep learning and be open to learning and be very good at learning. So mm-hmm. at new scale, because you don't know when the skill requirement will change and how it will change. There is no way that you can anticipate or preempt or you know the, the skills required 10 years from now. So all of this nonsense of uh, you know rote learning, which only was required to produce clerks for the lifetime, has to go. Reskilling is at three levels. One is what do you do with people whose jobs clearly are going to vanish, right? How do you reskill them? Right? So essentially you have to reskill them from the point of view of ensuring that their core competence is still maintained. But at the same time, the reskilling is about going ahead and working with the artificial intelligence as co-part. The second level of reskilling or skilling is to go ahead and actually teach our students from the ground level, from class one, class two, the whole idea of coding, of logic, of artificial intelligence systems. So you have to go ahead and look at artificial intelligence from a pedagogical perspective and say that how do I introduce it at the school level. The third level of reskilling is in terms of going ahead and ensuring that what are the boundary conditions for artificial intelligence to go ahead and work, right? What kind of ethical systems, what kind of moral system, what kind of rules, what kind of regulations, right? Is the artificial intelligence going ahead and giving the right kind of information? Now, that's something where you will still need a human layer. I think it's time also, therefore, to give far more emphasis on apprenticeship rather than on skilling. Mm. Because, you know, because skilling requires that you anticipate or even estimate the future demand. Which mm. is, you know, but on the other hand, those who are doing the work, those who are actually got their own you know, businesses and factories and so on, they know what they want. If we can encourage them and encourage the students, you know, to become, to get those summer jobs from a much earlier age than what they're earlier, and and be apprentices, because apprentices will learn the job for tomorrow. And, you know, and, and while skilling may always be lagging behind, and teaching you the skill for yesterday. Governments also need to take into account and need to prepare for a scenario where it will be challenging for certain segments of the population to upskill themselves beyond a point. There has to be a certain social support infrastructure to ensure that people uh, are supported in some way or the other. I think it could be something in the form of a basic income uh, or some sort of a social security apparatus that is available for uh, people who, uh, for various reasons, are not able to go ahead and upskill themselves. Global tech leaders like Sam Altman, Jeffrey Hinton, Steve Wozniak, Elon Musk, and so many others have called for a six months hold to technologies more advanced than ChatGPT, stating that they pose the risk of human extinction as well as socio-economic challenges. They have urged policy makers to equate at par risk posed by artificial intelligence with nuclear war and pandemics. There's an urgent need for regulating AI, but for that, mm-hmm. some fundamental questions have to be asked. Uh, how do we treat artificial intelligence as a mm-hmm. legal entity? Is it a company? Is it a principal? Is it an agent? Uh, mm-hmm. How do we recognize it? Mm-hmm. Can I give it the same kind of rights and obligations that I will give to a legal personality, maybe a mm-hmm. company, maybe a society? And if so, mm-hmm. what are going to be the ramifications? Further. Assuming that you give legality to AI, how mm-hmm. do you go ahead and imbibe ethical values in AI? Because there's a yeah. lot of bias in ethical uh, standards, uh, compliances, mm-hmm. as far as chat GPT is concerned. So no wonder okay. a lot of uh, biases coming up in programs like these, and these will have to be appropriately curbed. But the fundamental fear that all lawmakers is that in case of AI is not regulated, it could mm-hmm. go ahead and uh, shall shall I say, supersede human intelligence at a very early stage. One survey tells us that the human intelligence will be superseded by artificial intelligence 
by 2062. I believe that is inaccurate. We should be seeing that particular tipping point by 2035. Regulation is essential for a regulation yeah. with a light touch and with a focus on the developmental use of AI, how to mm -hmm. enhance that and you know, where to enhance that and therefore to encourage, uh, you know, if you like, innovators uh, to use AI for productive and socially useful purposes rather than let the market just you know, take the lead and, you know, and commercial interest take over. This regulation must be framed with a very open form of consultation between the different stakeholders. They should not be created you know, in some rooms or some by some officers, etc. Right. in the government. The time on, in this juncture, you know, like it happened to some extent with the internet revolution when the Y2K was with us and so on, and NASCOM played a very important role. Similarly here, even more so, you need a conversation between all the stakeholders to come together, and then the outline or then the structure of the regulation should come through, rather than in a top-down manner. I think it's now needed a universal platform, a global platform, where everybody should come together, especially given the warnings of the pioneers and so on, saying that, okay, this is where, this far and no further. Because after all, we can't as a species and do allow things which are in a some sense ex existential, ex existentially dangerous, uh, you know, to the species as a whole. The quandary that we will be facing is, how do we legally recognize artificial intelligence as a mm. legal entity? Because if you are a legal entity, you can you are required to do a number of rights, duties, and obligations. But yeah. a lot of times, those rights and duties may not be able to be fulfilled by artificial intelligence. Also, yeah. since artificial intelligence is the cognitive intelligence of mm. machines, somewhere down the line, the entire issue of liability will have to be considered by uh, the Indian law. What mm. happens if a legal injury or a legal harm is caused to you as a result of relying upon an action mm. done by artificial intelligence? And if that happens, who's going to be held liable for the same? Will it be uh, the company that's selling an artificial intelligence product or an algorithm? Or will it be uh, the person who's using the AI algorithm? Or will it actually be the person who's actually coded the AI algorithm? So to that extent, India will have to increasingly start making the coders liable because once they're coding, the law yeah. expects them to have reasonable the uh, duty of exercising due diligence to ensure right. that the said AI programs do not ultimately come up in a scenario that uh, ultimately lands up prejudicially impacting the customers mm. or the users' interests. Somewhere down the line, artificial intelligence as an algorithm will have to be audited so as to be mm. making sure that it does not have the intrinsic capabilities of getting rogue or it being misused against human interests. Also, right. ethical standards and ethical parameters will have to be again enforced by legal principles, which can either come in by means of a dedicated legislation on artificial intelligence, or we can amend the Information Technology Act 2000 and incorporate certain provisions therein. India is already talking of a new Digital India Act. Maybe the newly emerging technologies like artificial intelligence can be even effectively regulated by means of newly emerging uh, legislations like Digital India. AI has begun to start getting being used for criminal purposes. In fact, already on the dark net, you have cybercrime as a service powered by artificial intelligence. So in a scenario like this, I expect that uh, India should also come up with certain minimum legal provisions to penalize AI-enabled crime or AI-committed uh, cybercrime so that the misuse of artificial intelligence for cybercrime can be potentially regulated at an early stage. India is not only the world's most populous nation, but also looked at as a role model by a large number of smaller and developing countries. out artificial intelligence development will also tilt the balance to a large extent as to how artificial intelligence jurisprudence will begin to evolve.
India could come out with its own customized approach as to how, as a nation, we would want to regulate artificial intelligence, including generative artificial intelligence. Thank you for watching Checks and Balances.